Today in our science and technology segment, we'll meet a young Harvard scientist whose work on robotic bees may literally someday save the world from starvation. Starting in 2006, bee colonies around the world started to mysteriously disappear. Beekeepers in the U.S., Europe, and as far as Taiwan panicked as they saw up to half of their bees die off in a single year. Dubbed CCD, Colony Collapse Disorder, scientists blamed everything from vampire mites to pesticides, even cell phone radiation. While no one knows for certain why bees are disappearing, we do know that bees work, pollination, is responsible for one-third of all the food eaten in the world. Every time you bite into a piece of fruit, you have a bee to thank. Even when you order a burger and fries at the drive-thru, you can thank a bee for pollinating the potatoes and the alfalfa and the clover eaten by the cows. Maybe in the future, you'll be thanking Professor Wood. So, Professor Wood, you're a brilliant young scientist at Harvard. You could have studied anything, worked on any project, you've decided to build robotic bees. How did you come to this? Where did the idea come from? When I was a grad student at UC Berkeley, I, I was looking around for interesting projects to, uh, to start working on, and, and lo and behold, a, a project on a robotic fly was just in its infancy there, so what cooler project than, than making little robotic insects? That cool project has led Robert Wood to Harvard, and his micro-robotics lab has had many breakthroughs in the development of autonomous robots, including the first successful flight of a life-sized robotic fly in 2007. Bees or flies, they might sound like uh, subtle differences, and, and in fact they are. Um, bees we use uh, a lot for their, um, their social behaviors, so a lot of, large part of uh, uh, some of the, the research under the RoboBees project is actually aimed at uh, understanding how the, the whole could be greater than the sum of the parts by proper uh, coordination amongst the individuals. But there's also an underlying theme here of trying to perhaps counter a problem associated with climate change. The inception of the, the RoboBees project started when uh, Gu Yanwei, one of my colleagues here at Harvard, and sort of popped in and said, hey, you know, I saw this documentary that talked about this, this horrible thing called colony collapse disorder, where all the bee colonies are, are in collapse all over the world. And he said, well, wouldn't it be great to, to think of a technological solution to this? Robert and his team envisioned their nature-inspired research could lead to a greater understanding of how to artificially mimic the collective behavior and intelligence of a bee colony. So what's the idea here? You have this robotic bee, what would it do? You can imagine multiple bees, maybe tens or hundreds of them working together, flying around trying to find a particular species of flower, loitering around the flower to pollinate it, going from flower to flower, and in that way basically pollinating that field. And you're talking about a little computer, a tiny flying computer that can, what, see things? Not in the ways that, that you and I might think about it. So it's, yes, there would be some, some small amount of computation on board. Yes, there'd be some sort of sensing of, of, of perception of the environment that it might have. Uh, but these are all the fundamental challenges. This is what gets us really excited about this project is, is all of these underlying fundamental issues that a, a little robotic bee would have to do. That means we have to come up with new ways to see things. That means we have to come up with uh, new ways to, to compute things, to rationalize about, uh, uh, the robot to rationalize about what it's seeing and to make decisions appropriately. So these are all things which nothing off the shelf would work. So this isn't a remote control bee. You're talking about a self-contained little computer that flies around and makes decisions just like a bee. Exactly. In some senses, I would argue that autonomy is one of the biggest challenges for robotics. And, and if you think about the scale, the, the frequency, uh, the, the, the speed at which these things are operating, uh, it, it only exacerbates that challenge. Among the practical applications envisioned for the so-called robo-bees, autonomously pollinating a field of crops, military surveillance, weather and climate mapping, traffic monitoring, even search and rescue. You can imagine, for example, uh, a uh, collapsed building and uh, maybe a firefighter has a box of hundreds or thousands of these little flying robots, sends them in with appropriate sensors and they, they report back to see if they found any survivors. Robert and his team hope to have bees flying around under tightly controlled lab conditions in about five years and be mass producing them about 10 years after that. Can you improve on nature or are you simply trying your best to, uh, to simulate it? I mean, with the 500 million year head start that nature's got on us, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of phenomenal solutions that we're, I mean, still uncovering of, of, uh, of some of these really challenging uh, feats. And, and no, we're not, we're not quite close to 
uh, com to, to being comparable to some of these natural systems. However, I mean, to some extent we have a, a bit of an advantage. We have engineered materials uh, that, that we can use as opposed to being limited to you know, organic materials. And, and there's a number of different examples like that too. Okay, one last question. When I think about a robotic fly, I can imagine all of these um, very interesting applications in espionage, the literal fly on the wall. Has anyone talked to you about building the fly on the wall? No, I've never heard that before. No, no of course, yes, that, that's, uh, uh, and in fact, some of the funding that, that uh, we have for some of our, uh, uh, our robotic fly work is uh, from uh, some, some DOD sources. And, and in fact, yes, that would be uh, something to tell you, maybe not necessarily who's in a, uh, a collapsed building after a natural disaster, but maybe who's over the next hill. And, and you can imagine that that would be of interest to, to a lot of people. Wow.